Test, test. Hey, hey, can you hear me all right? Can everybody hear me? Yep, yep. I can hear just fine. Can I listen to people? Mark, so I, I want to start with uh, the founding story of Netflix, something you wrote about uh, wonderfully in your book. You wrote about wonderfully in your book, that will never work. Uh, and, and, Oh, sorry, of Netflix, something you wrote about in, in my favorite book of 2019, I think, my favorite book of the year so far, uh, That Will Never Work, which is the story of Netflix written 16 years later. And, and uh, the reason. Hello. Hey, Mark. How's it going? Oh, life is beautiful. How are you today? All right, thanks. Uh, a quick question. Are we doing video or just audio? No, so I always start with video to smile and say hello, but then I turn it off to keep the streaming high quality. Okay, but in other words, you, what, what will be published, so to speak? It's just the, audio. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, well, are, you not, are you not dressed for podcasts today? No, I'd set myself up so my cord didn't show, and so I'd put my little camera down, so I was looking you right in the eye, and, you know, all that kind of crap. <laughs> well, Is thank my, you very much. You're a real pro. <laughs> oh, wait. I, yeah, I don't even have you on. There you go. Sorry. Ah, there are. Oh, you're in the home library. I like it. Yeah, see, I would have. I was saying I, I had this dangling, but I would tuck it back and. Ah, no, you can uh, you can cozy up, get comfortable, however you like. I always figure starting on video is nice, especially with somebody I've never met before, and then uh, we'll, we'll turn it off before we start recording. Well, totally good. So, hi. Hello. Thank you so much. Oh, you have like the cool glasses that like flip up this way. That's very hip. Yeah, they're the click, the click yeah. style. Just more because I lead such an active lifestyle that I, uh, I, 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 when I used to wear them on a chain around my neck, I would break a pair like every week or so. So that finally solves a good problem. Yeah, I, I like it. Are you, uh, so where do you know Gary Swart from? Uh, wow. So Gary, well, Gary and I both worked at Pure Atria. Way, way back when, because, uh -huh. you know, Pure Atria, uh, I ended up there because Reed bought yep. the startup I was at, and Gary was there, and then one time, um, we were at a sales conference in Cabo, and, or no, Cabo, and somewhere, somewhere in, down in Mexico, um, and I was just kind of, I had just joined the company, and I was like hanging out in the lobby, and Gary was there, and he, ha he had like eight women he was taking out to dinner he seems the type <laughs> and and he, yeah, yeah true but then he all he's he kind of panicking being the only guy with these eight women and he saw me sitting in the lobby and he goes oh my god you've got it he didn't even know me he goes you've got to come to dinner with me and i go well okay so it ended up me and gary and these other eight women so that's how i met gary but ever since we've been surfing buddies so we do a annual surf trip to uh, to mexico and then he comes over to see, he just bought a house in Santa Cruz so he can be closer to the waves here. So that's how we, stay, that's kind of how we stayed connected uh, over the years. That's not so bad. I don't know if this is uh, offensive or not. I haven't decided yet, but I was talking to a friend right before this and she said, what are you doing? I go, oh, I'm about to interview the founder of Netflix. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Where'd you meet him? Well, I, I met Gary and I think Gary and Mark are in the you know, group of 50 plus year old men who could still kick your ass. <laughs> 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 and, and so I, I figured you were just surfing, cycling, running, everything else active buddies. He, he's, yeah, well, a, he, he's a physical like specimen, Gary. Oh, well, yeah. He, you know, I don't know if you know, he, he was a model. And uh, that's, how he, that's how he supported himself in like, college and, and slightly thereafter. Ah, uh, gotcha. So, yeah, they didn't hire me for that gig. No, no, me neither. <laughs> but the good news is, you know, Gary's a, be a better surfer than me because he is. He's really, he's really fit. But and he's been doing Peloton, you know, the, the indoor biking stuff. Mm -hmm. But I have, I have, a, I built a big flow, a big uh, flow trail on our property here in Santa Cruz. And it's, it, it's not huge. It's probably almost a half a mile long, but it's like five or 600 vertical feet. That's very and cool. we do laps on it. So we, we invited Gary to come out because uh, he's Mr. Peloton, you know, he's like so competitive and, 
And he goes, yeah, no problem. But believe me, it kicked his ass. So I felt very good about that. It didn't translate directly from the gym to the, uh, to the trails. Well, that, that's very comforting. At least you pulled a yeah. fast one on him over there. In your own exactly. backyard too, Mark. In your own, exactly. your own turf. Whatever, <laughs> whatever it takes, I guess. Home court advantage. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, thank you so much for, I really appreciate you doing this. This is going to be a blast. Oh, I'm looking forward to it as well. Yeah. Just unplugging, uh, unplugging my landlines. It doesn't ring in the middle of the interview. There awesome. we go. <laughs> uh, I've had a lot worse happen. Um, <laughs> I now have like six different backups of everything. One of the like first big interviews I ever did was about five years ago. And it was with Anson Dorrance, who's uh, one of the winningest athletic coaches of all time, women's Olympic soccer coach and college coach and like huge guy. Um, and my equipment malfunctioned. Oh, my gosh. I watched the interview. And I was absolutely heartbroken because like, come on, 21 year old kid does this Olympic guy interview, lost it. So now I have backups on, I got three mics here. Like everything is <laughs> I'm as protected as can be. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of slowly, I'm slowly yeah. trying to up my game, you know, so. It's not bad. Oh, you have, well, see, you have the, um, uh, the, what's it called? The, the splash pop mic. The pop the, mic. Uh, yeah. The pop mic. So that, the pop shield. That's really good. When I, I live in San Francisco and I have like very nice home equipment there with the pop filters and everything like else like that. I ran away for this quarantine to my parents' suburban home in New York, uh, more space and, and more dogs. But so now I'm, I'm here with uh, my dad's recording mic. Where in the, where in the suburbs are you? They're on Long Island. Uh, not Long Island. Okay. Yeah. Which is, uh, yeah, not, not quite Santa Cruz, but not so bad. Do you know I grew up in in New York in the suburbs I, of New York? I do. Westchester. I heard. Yeah. I, I uh, Gary recommended your book, and I was a huge fan. Oh, great! Yeah, <laughs> cool. I I, bu I bought a couple of copies for a couple of friends, and and so yeah, I, I heard the New York story there. Between awesome. your biography uh, and Ray Dalio's biography, Long Island has been getting like a strong, <laughs> <laughs> a strong rep lately. <laughs> yeah. New York, uh, the hotbed of uh, entrepreneurship. Apparently, I hope so. Um, well, listen, uh, let's, you want to do this thing? I'm all set. Awesome. So for some context, uh, it's called The Gong. It's about sales at startups. So we'll sort of tell the founding story of Netflix, you know, that whole spiel. But um, the best things are like, here's things we did, cool growth uh, things that we did, milestones we hit, how we combated stale growth. Um, we're going to talk about the, you know, uh, the tech crash, the dot com bubble, and, and how you guys manage that to get some learnings for today. Um, and also all the stuff you're doing with Looker and Chubbies. And I love that you're a board member of Chubbies. Uh, that just, there's something about that that makes me very happy. Yeah, um, me too. They're pretty cool guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. I'll, I'm on super. The, I'm on the board of a, on, of a, uh, outdoors nonprofit as well. So I saw you are part of uh, uh, the outdoor school, which is very, very cool. Yeah. Cool. Which one are you, which one are you a part of? Uh, it's called Unique Places to Save. They're uh, pretty big in, in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Colorado, and they do a lot of like mitigation banking and, and conservation kind of stuff. Oh, good for you. Well, thank nice. you. I'll keep them busy. Um, all right. All right, you ready? I'm ready. So we'll, we'll turn video off here, right? Yeah, let's do that for good streaming. Uh, stop video. Perfect. You can still hear me? I'm still here, yeah. Loud and clear. Mark? Randolph, welcome to the gong. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be with you. I know. Long Island strong and proud. This feels, uh, this feels like homecoming, doesn't it? That's good. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, both of us should be putting on our strong New York accents just to kind of uh, harken back. Hey, well, my favorite bagel place is closed, so I'm, I'm, I'm in a bit of a tough mood here, but uh, at yeah. least I get to speak with a fellow New Yorker at the very least. Well, I'll just get a cup of coffee and, uh, <laughs> and be ready to roll. Oh, very nice. Um, uh, I, I thought a great place to start would be the historical context around which Netflix was founded. Uh, you know, there's a number of ways that technology companies come to be. Some of them look at a new technology and find an old industry to apply it to. Some of them uh, find an old technology and, and find an industry that hasn't seen it yet. You know, Chegg is an example I like where they were launched in the mid 2000s and they brought e-commerce, which was a decade old, to textbook rentals, which was very new. Uh, Netflix seems to be, have been that first case where if, you know, the story that I heard uh, is around the fact that, you know, Mark really wanted to found something selling something on the internet and uh, you weren't sure exactly what it is. So I'd love for you to give some context of what the mid nineties were like around e-commerce and, and why you were so excited to be selling something on the internet. 
Well, that's, that's kind of the convergence of two different stories, uh, which is the historical piece and, the, and then the why me piece of it. But certainly, let's start, let's, let's start briefly with the why me, since that might lead better into it, which is that, you know, I was, I was uh, almost, you know, 40 years old when I did, uh, did Netflix, it was 38. So I had been in business for a while. I'd done a bunch of startups. Netflix was number six. But the previous, the first half of my career, the first 20 years, I was a direct marketing guy, you know, junk mail. Uh, catalogs, um, mail order, uh, magazine circulation. All these things involve that same practice of having people uh, order things over the phone or through the mail based on uh, looking at things in print. Uh, and for some reason, I had always found that fascinating. But I also knew quite a bit about how to sell to people remotely like that. And now, through a whole bunch of circumstances, I ended up in California, and I ended up uh, out of a job, and right then was kind of the birth of the internet. This was in 1996, and uh, the internet had been out for a bunch of years, but people were still trying to figure out, what do we do with this thing that connects all these people? And some people were experimenting with selling things over the internet. Uh, Amazon uh, was out. And at the point, at that point, Amazon, believe it or not, was a bookstore only. I mean, it only sold books. Um, but Jeff Bezos was already demonstrating that the internet was actually a pretty interesting way to sell books. But for me, who had spent my entire career doing catalogs and mail order and direct response marketing, I saw something even more exciting. I kind of realized that this whole internet and e-commerce thing was really just direct marketing on steroids. It was an unbelievably powerful tool to do the types of things that I was already accustomed to doing. Like I was doing very primitive personalization. I don't know whether you remember what it was like back then, but you would, you'd get these um, crappy mail, pieces of mail that would say, hi, Mark, won't all your neighbors on Old Roaring Brook Road? You know, it was, it was ridiculous, but it didn't customize the offer. It didn't customize anything based on who I really was. And I saw the internet could actually create a whole different offer for every different person who came in. So at that point, um, I knew that for my next company, it was going to involve selling something on the internet. That was the requirement. The optionals, the good to haves, one of them was going to be personalization. I would love it if I could have the idea involve personalization. And the other one is I was hoping I could do a subscription model too. But that was kind of a distant thought because I had done all that magazine uh, subscription business. So I knew how that worked too. So kind of all these things were lining up. Internet booming, spreading rapidly, people demonstrating you could sell things on the internet and me having come from 20 years of seeing direct response and recognizing immediately this was the time and this was the place. I, that, that reminds me a lot of the famous commencement speech that Steve Jobs gave where he talked about you can only connect the dots looking backwards. <laughs> yes, so, exactly. Looking backwards, your direct mail experience, the fact that this was not your first startup, uh, the fact that you had thought about personalization and done some already in an analog version, like all these things only made sense as they relate to Netflix, you know, five years after Netflix was founded and you were a website where you kind of customize what I saw on my screen based on who I am. Exactly. But you know, that, that, that you have to recognize, and I always do, how much of success is luck. It's being in the right place at the right time. It's having things break your way. It's having these things happen randomly seemingly. Um, but you know, luck is also preparation. Um, and you, you have to have certain things in your pocket so you recognize these opportunities when you see them. So I was certainly lucky that um, I happened to be in California with this background when the internet was developing. Um, certainly been good for me. <laughs> 
and, and, and the rest of us, especially while everyone spends <laughs> all this time on the couch uh, right now. Uh, tell me about timing because when you were telling that story of you happen to be in the right place at the right time, the internet you know, was still super early and maybe Jeff Bezos was proving something out, but there were still a lot of doubters. Uh, one of my favorite documentaries is, is by CNN and I actually watched it on Netflix and they do one every decade, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Uh, the one about the 90s has this news anchor from I think CNBC talking in maybe like 1998 about what is this internet thing? Where is the internet? Like somebody show me where it's hidden. And so people were still really not understanding what this thing was, but you saw something in it. And, and uh, there feels to be like a corollary to when people talk about virtual reality, which they did a ton in the early 2010s. And they said, this is the moment. This is the time where virtual reality is here. Or self-driving cars in 2018, where this is the moment. This is the time we finally have. These are blockchain, you know, maybe, maybe two or three years ago. When you think about both the timing that you had with, with the internet and, and that wave you rode at, at seemingly the right time, and do you want to give advice to somebody who believes that they have a wave to ride? How do you recommend people think about the timing of a, a technology as it comes to market? You know, you take something like artificial intelligence, people have been saying artificial intelligence is here every 10 years for about 50 years. And maybe they got it right this time. You know, maybe they're still a couple of years off. How do you think about the importance of timing on a, on a, on a maybe macro level? Well, listen, on a macro level, if you're, if you're making the decision about whether to hook up your grandfather's life support system to it, I would certainly wait until you were pretty confident it was established. But if you're looking to build a business on a new technology, you can't wait. Those, those days are gone. Um, these days, you have to bet, and you have to bet early. You have to bet before anyone has any real assurance that the thing you're betting on is going to happen. And you have to recognize you're taking those chances. I mean, just look at the example of, of you know, when Reed Hastings and I started Netflix, uh, we did it because DVD was coming out. And when we did this very first test, DVD was in test market. You couldn't even buy it. Um, except in a few cities in the United States. And even then, the players were thousands of dollars. And we bet a company on the fact that eventually DVD would work. So we saw the opportunity in this technology, no evidence whatsoever whether it would succeed or fail. We had no idea if it would go the way of the Betamax. We had no idea if it would go the way of the LaserDisc. Um, but we hoped it would go the way of the VCR. Um, and... We were lucky and it did. But if you wait, if you say, I'm going to wait on the sidelines until I know uh, that this technology is proven, you're way too late. Yeah, I, I was speaking, this actually might have been in a conversation with our, our mutual connection, Gary Swart, uh, who used to be the CEO of Upwork, and we were speaking about timing and how it relates to valuation. And what we were talking about is how the biggest companies of an industry are launched at the dawn of that age. You know, Amazon and e-commerce, Netflix and streaming, Microsoft and software, IBM and, and computers. Uh, the, and those are like the, you know, hundred billion or trillion dollar companies. But then you could still build a multi-billion dollar business coming, you know, five or 10 years after that. You just need to go a lot more niche. I love the story of you starting Netflix on the back of DVDs. I think in your book, you talk about how, you know, when you launch there are, maybe 900 DVDs, if that, in, in the entire world, and, and you're able to have 100% of the catalog. How do you think maybe from that experience about when you speak with founders now and you do a lot of teaching and speaking, how, how do you think founders should be approaching niche? How, how niche is too niche? Um, and, and when is it time to kind of broaden out? Yeah, it's a big discipline. I mean, you, the best ideas... Uh, that the best businesses start out in a niche that is too small for anyone else to want to bother with or is too difficult for anyone else to bother with or has some other issue that makes it unattractive. So those are great places to start because they give you the time and the freedom and the anonymity to experiment until you've figured out how to solve that problem. But 
the best ones are ones where you can see this path that if I can solve the first part, it gives me permission to now solve the second part, which gives me permission to solve the third part. And they leapfrog from one to the other. And if you go back classically to even the example of, you know, Apple computer, uh, at the beginning, that device was sold into art departments because it could do that because of its uh, rendering abilities so much more powerfully than an IBM PC could do. And so they were able to penetrate that. But this was never supposed to be just an art computer. The idea was that once they would penetrate, penetrate art departments in advertising departments in all these corporations, there'd be an adjacency. And they go, then what's next? Then what's next? And I think that's the same thing for anyone attacking a problem. You don't want to jump ahead of yourself, but if you can see that getting this right leads you to the next one, that's all the more powerful a place to be. Yeah. Can you, can you tell that story a bit as it comes uh, in the perspective of Netflix? I mean, you guys obviously started with DVDs when they were just in a test market. You launched when there was a few hundred. It took some time, but DVDs quite quickly grew. Uh, what were some of the important sort of limitations or, or discipline you put on yourself in that period of time that you look back on and say, you know, like that was the hard decision, but it was the right decision in terms of discipline. <laughs> Wow, uh, let's see where to go with this one. Um, you know, the, the, the book that I, that I wrote, you know, That'll Never Work, it's called That Will Never Work because everybody who I told this idea to had that exact same reaction. You know, my, my wife had that reaction. And they usually had two different things in mind. And one was the fact that how could you have a DVD rental by mail business when there's a blockbuster in every corner. So there was that. And then the other one, of course, was um, why would anybody want to rent a DVD by mail, which is what Netflix was at the beginning, when it's just a matter of days or weeks before everyone is going to be downloading movies because they're digital after all. And so one of the very first things we had to do is recognize that we had to get the timing right, that even though we acknowledged it was true that eventually, yes, everyone is going to be um, downloading or streaming movies, we weren't sure which, but we couldn't enter that category now uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. You know, the bandwidth wasn't there. Uh, the, any internet connection that came in connected to your computer, not to your house, not to your television. Uh, Hollywood didn't, wasn't making the titles available. So there was a discipline that said, we have to wait and be patient. We have to build a business which is viable now in this DVD age, but start slowly building up these assets so that if and when the world shifts and goes to streaming, we're in a good position. Um, and that turned out to take 10 years. So it was just as well that we, we focused on, um, on the DVD business. But focus was really the kind of the middle name at Netflix. That's what we spent so much time is not just deciding what to do, but deciding what not to do. And we even had a name for it. We called it the Canada principle. Uh, and the Canada principle had its origins um, in this argument people would always make that go, why aren't we shipping to Canada? That would be so easy and that would be an instant 10% bump because that's about a tenth the mark of the U.S. And it's tempting to go, great, we'll just ship to Canada. But then you realize that even though it seems easy, it's not quite as easy as it seems. I mean, for one, you know, they do speak a second language in, uh, in Canada, which is mandated by law in some parts of Canada. Uh, they use a different currency. Uh, they have different postage. You have different DVD zones in some cases. All these little things which accumulated to make this easy, low-hanging fruit really not quite so low-hanging. And we realized ultimately that the effort it would take to go into Canada to do this incremental low-hanging fruit things, if you applied that same effort to your core business, you'd get a much bigger bang than the 10%. And uh, that, that focus stayed with us forever. And it still is part of the Netflix DNA. And I think still it's one of the reasons why that company um, is so successful 
as opposed to companies like, you know, Disney, which has theme parks and uh, cruise lines and um, Apple, which is making, you know, cell phones. It's the focus is an amazingly powerful tool. Two, two part question. So I, I love that you brought the Canada principle as one of my favorite uh, sort of names and concepts. And I think it's very clearly illustrated by the title of the principle. The Canada principle is just don't go, <laughs> don't go where you don't need to go. Um, so two questions. One is what do you think is the worst case scenario if you had, had gone to Canada, you know, what, what, like, would that have, what, 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 what would have gone poorly? What is the other side of the coin, the dark side of the coin of not being laser focused and of going to Canada, for example, if you were, if you were to do some revisionist history and uh, second question is on a, on a bit of a different tack, but you know, Netflix right now is still super focused. Um, you don't really build hardware. You did get into a, well, you, you, you yourself left quite some time ago, but Netflix, the company did get into original content. Um, but still super, super focused. Meanwhile, companies uh, of similar or larger sizes have this whole flywheel where content is just one piece of it. So it actually seems for a company like Apple or Amazon or Disney, their additional content uh, offering is really just another piece of the larger flywheel to build a, bi build a bigger business. So do you think that once a business gets large enough, hyper-focus actually can be detrimental to to any further growth. So uh, <laughs> two part question. That's a two big, two. so let's, first of all, the problem with going into Canada or the problem of doing these things, let's just add this on. This, this won't be a real big issue. It may not seem so at first, but you can't anticipate because all of a sudden you have another feature you want to add that is core to your business, but all of a sudden you go, oh, wait a minute. We have to now also do that for the Canadian customers. Or um, we have to make this reverse compatible. Or we, you begin accreting all of these little small parts of your business and it slows you down. Your reporting gets more complicated. Your finances get more complicated. Your management structure gets more complicated. This little thing, which seems self-evidently great in isolation, when you begin accumulating, it makes everything more difficult. Staying streamlined is an amazingly powerful tool. So going forward, I, I listen, you can certainly get someone on who will argue about the flywheel approach and about how having this diversity of businesses like an Amazon does is an amazingly powerful tool and perhaps for Amazon in the aggregate. But that presumes that for a company like Netflix, they've gotten to the point where there's no more growth left in their core business and that they should add on and they should begin other adjacencies that they can um, support from this core business. But that premise is flawed because Netflix does not believe that their growth is slowing. They believe, and I believe, they're still at the beginning. I mean, they have 150 million, 160 million subscribers, which sounds like a huge amount. You know, but what does YouTube have? Like 2 billion average users? I mean, how many smartphones are there in the world? 4 billion? I mean, these are huge numbers. And... The, that is the future of how people are going to be uh, um, uh, consuming content. So not this is the Canada principle writ large. Is any effort you'd make building an adjacency, if it's taken instead and applied to making your core offering better, it's more powerful. And maybe as a big company in Amazon or Apple is certainly they're both extremely valuable, extremely great companies. Their model is very different, but when it comes to competing in something like streaming, neither of them will be able to compete effectively against Netflix in that core business. Uh, I, I, I guess that makes sense. I'll, I'll take your word for that on that one, Mark. <laughs> uh, the balance between growth and revenue is, is another question. So it strikes me, you know, when you think about the founding story of Netflix, you guys prioritize the business model. You talk about it a lot in the book, and you even mentioned it a few min minutes ago which is, you know, you really want to have a subscription business. You really want to see if people would pay for this. 
you know, one of the, uh, the stories you tell, which I thought was interesting. And uh, it was just such a fun book to read. Cause I just remember like the whole thing you're talking about is my childhood, right? I remember going to blockbuster and picking out a movie and that was an awesome experience, even if they didn't have my favorite movie. And then I remember, uh, getting my DVD in the mail from Netflix. And I, I will actually admit every once in a while, if I loved a movie, Netflix sent me enough, I would actually quote unquote, accidentally slip in an old Xbox game I don't play anymore and send you guys a, <laughs> a different disc. And I, maybe you were, you were too busy or too nice to call me out on it, but I, I've kept a few DVDs. But like all these things, all these problems that you talk about in the book were really, really wonderful to see. But what you guys, what you talked about is, you know, will people pay for a DVD to come in two days later or eventually did next day shipping, but still instead of going to Blockbuster and getting it right now, when you now advise companies or in any of the startups that you did, where do you think is the right balance between growth to you know, prove that lots and lots of people will do a certain thing and revenue or business model to prove at least somebody will pay for it? You know, I might think of something like uh, you're on the board of Looker and Looker yeah. is a business intelligence platform. And they could have gone two ways. They could have said, we're going to go you know, free for a certain amount of time and we're just going to build the most kick-ass business intelligence and it'll be self-improving because we'll have more clients. Or they could have gone, and I don't know which one of these two they did, but, or they could have gone and said, we're going to find a single customer who's going to pay us uh, you know, 50 bucks, just something, for a true MVP. And both of them had advantages, both of them had disadvantages. How do you think about maybe when you advise the balance between revenue and growth. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking because I I don't necessarily. That's not something that I think about all that much. Um, and certainly, even in, in the Looker case, that company became what it wanted to become. You know, our vision for it was very different when we started that than what it actually did. I mean, originally. That was supposed to be a, a webby, self servicey type business. You know, the way you'd sign up for Zoom or something like that, you know, or Optimizely, where it's, you know, on the web entirely. But it didn't want to. It wanted to be a big product. But how do I think about the growth? I, I, I think about, the, they both, listen, I'm an early stage guy. And for an early stage company, they both have to be there. Um, they don't, you don't need to maximize revenue, just like you don't need to maximize growth, but you have to demonstrate that both of those are possible. In other words, doing a test where all you do is grow users doesn't tell you anything. But doing one where all you do is prove that one or two people will pay, that doesn't tell you anything either. You have to be able to demonstrate that your product or service can grow on both axes. Um, neither of them need to be repeatable or scalable, but it, certainly if you have to, if you can't demonstrate that someone's willing to pay more for the service than it ultimately will cost you to provide it, uh, you haven't shown anything. And all the same, if you can't demonstrate you have something which is beyond the interests of a handful of narrowly focused people, then you don't have anything that interests me either. I think you, that it's not one or the other. You need to have both. I was on I was on vacation with a friend once, and uh, he the waiter asked him, hey, "This is what we have on special. Would you like the margarita or the beer?" And he said, "Well, por qué no los dos? Yeah, well, you got you got <laughs> you got to have both." Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I want to you know right now we're recording this in in early April, and the world is going through a health and economic crisis. Things are changing a lot, and uh, every investor, pundit, technologist, I think anybody with two thumbs and a, and a smartphone and a Twitter account is telling you, oh, this reminds me of 2008 and this reminds me of the dot-com bust and, and uh, you know, a few people are talking about oil crises of the 70s and the 80s, but not, not as many. You had an internet company uh, that you took through the largest technology-specific bust uh, in, in history probably. Can you provide a bit of context to what it was like to be leading Netflix? One of the, yeah, you know, I think you were about to go public when the when the floor fell out. What what was your experience like back in in two thousand two thousand one during that bust? And and what do you you know right now? You're on the board of a few companies. You advise a lot of companies. What would you tell entrepreneurs right now who are going through their own version of it? I'll tell you the second 
part of the, that answer first, which is in some ways what's happening today is worse. Uh, in 2000, what evaporated overnight was the funding. Um, but customers were still there. What's happening today is you have both things evaporating simultaneously, both the customers are going away and the funding's going away. Um, but let me tell you about what happened you know, in 2000. Uh, and one of the great things about me jumping on at, at the beginning of the internet wave is I got to ride that boom of um, exuberance um, and what some even called irrational exuberance. Uh, but it had gotten to the point, Netflix was now two and a half years old, that um, people were going crazy for anything with a dot com at the end of it. Um, a lot of people other than me, now two years after, I, after three years after I kind of saw it coming, were realizing, oh my gosh, this is going to be the next wave. We need to get involved in this. And as a result of that, ridiculous amounts of money were now pouring in to um, the tech sector, especially the internet sector. I mean, it was almost like you could walk out on the highway and, and, and flag down a big truck uh, full of money and they just back up in your driveway and they, they dump all the money into your driveway and you go out with the wheelbarrows and bring it in the house. Um, it was almost that easy. And you began building your company based on that. This feeling that the money will never dry up and therefore we don't really need to have um, any kind of profit or any kind of gross margin even that we'll just build audience and we'll figure out how to monetize it later and at netflix there was a similar issue we, we were on, on the verge of going public we were in reg registered to go public we were modifying our business model to be a portal rather than a dvd rental by mail company and right in the midst of that boom everything stops and it goes from where having dot com at the end of your name was this free ticket to get uh, infinite venture money to all of a sudden being the scarlet letter where you were untouchable um, nobody wanted to give you money um, and it was a terrible thing and for netflix the problem was doubly bad because we had finally cracked the code of how to do DVD rental by mail. And the key was a subscription. There was no due dates, no late fees. You kept the disc as long as you wanted. You paid one monthly fee. Now, it was great because people loved this. No one was canceling. The subscriber account was growing. But this no due dates, no late fees thing was a little confusing. And so we were giving everyone their first month free. There's Mark and his subscription background coming into play. And the thing with subscriptions is they're a very powerful tool because once you have a customer, you have them for hopefully multiple years. So you can afford to pay fairly handsomely in acquisition cost. And so maybe 30 or $40 a customer goes out the door on day one to acquire the customer. And then you earn back a couple dollars a month from them for hopefully four or five years. But what happens is that when boom, all of a sudden you're booming, money is flying out the door with all these new customers coming in. So on one hand you go, this is incredible. We are growing you know, like gangbusters here. But on the other hand, the amount of money it takes is going up astronomically too, which was great when venture money was easy, but all of a sudden when venture money is impossible, we're screwed. And for us, we didn't know what to do. We had a successful model. We had a growing business. On paper, we had a great lifetime value, but we weren't sure we could afford to keep it up. And so for us, we decided to do that prudent thing that um, startups do, is, is to pursue strategic alternatives, which of course is that code word for, uh, we gotta sell this sucker. Um, and that's what led us, uh, to make that fateful trip one day to Blockbuster trying to find a easy way out.
Uh, oh, well, well, for the people who don't know it, I think folks would love to hear that story because it's, you know, for folks who like tech history, I think it is a, a an incredibly hilarious story of the way things turn out and also quite a bit of an Aesop's fable about what big companies should learn and, and think about when it comes to startups. And it's along the lines of, you know, uh, was it Yahoo that wanted to buy AOL at some point or, or Microsoft that wanted to buy Google, but that never happened. Like it's along those lines. So I would love to hear from uh, your own, your own words, the story of how Blockbuster did not quite buy Netflix. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, your last question had kind of led into what, you know, what do we, what people do? And the answer is uh, for every founder, uh, number rule number one is don't run out of money. Uh, and that is kind of the situation that unfortunately I found myself in in the fall of uh, summer and fall of the year 2000 with that old collapse of the dot com bubble. Um, and what we thought, okay, Blockbuster. And at the time, Blockbuster was in a pretty different spot than we were, you know, because we, I think we were on track that year to do about $5 million in revenue. But Blockbuster was on track to do about $6 billion. You know, we had, I guess, a couple hundred employees and they had 60,000 employees and they had 9,000 stores. I mean, it was like even a David and Goliath doesn't even begin. This was Ant and Elephant or something like that. So when we tried calling them to get this meeting, you know, nothing. They had no interest in talking to us. Um, and then, of course, it took a while, but about two or three months in, they finally did call and say, we'll meet with you. And they flew it. We flew out to Dallas, Texas, um, and uh, took a cab to this huge, to us, you know, 30-story glass and steel building, which was the Blockbuster headquarters, and up the elevator and into this cavernous conference room. Um, and as this quick little weird aside, uh, they had called us when we were on this corporate retreat in Santa Barbara. And so all we had with us was like shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops. And so there Reed Hastings and I were um, in this beautiful conference room wearing our shorts and t-shirts meeting with the blockbuster execs. And I think there. you were, if, if I remember the book correctly, you're also sporting a hangover. <laughs> yes, that's true. It was a, it was a tricky time. <laughs> like, like, yeah, and the other one was, you know, they, they, you're right. They called us that, that, you know, that night before and said, oh, we'll see you tomorrow morning. And we were not in Santa Barbara. We were up in the hill, uh, the foothills outside of Santa Barbara, this little dude ranch. And yeah, there was, there was alcohol involved. And we go, there's just no way for us to get from Santa Barbara to Dallas by the morning. And so we actually chartered a corporate jet figuring, uh, you know, listen, what's another fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 if we're already, uh, you know, $50 million in the hole. Um, and here's a trivia. This is, people don't know this. The, the, the jet belonged to Vanna White. That was who was chartering it. Not if you remember who that is. The yeah, pick a turns, letter. <laughs> turns letters on Wheel of Fortune. Exactly. Anyway, so we're, we're, we're all in this huge cavernous conference room. Those guys are in their fancy suits and wearing our shorts and t-shirts. But we had a great pitch, which is that we would join forces. They would buy us out. That we would run the online business for which we had expertise. They would run the stores that we would explore all these synergies that people are always talking about. And then everybody wins. And, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was going pretty well. They were nodding, they're asking good questions. And then of course, um, the big question, which is, you know, how much should we pay for you? And we'd rehearsed this on the plane um, and decided since we were $50 million in the hole at that point, that $50 million sounds about right. And, you know, it, it uh, they didn't quite uh, see it as clearly as we did. And you know, they didn't laugh, but it was pretty close. Uh, I think it was more they were astounded at the hubris that this little dot com with $5 million in sales at the peak of the, the trough of the collapse of the dot com um, funding bubble would have the nerve to ask $50 million. So it was a, a kind of a long, quiet 
plane ride back to Santa Barbara. But, you know, what was really interesting about it was when we had gotten the call, I was pumped. I go, oh, we're saved. And now our problem becomes their problem. Or at least we can solve this together. Um, there way more access to funds than we do. We can build this combined model. I could find myself getting all excited about it, that this was going to be the hand from God that came down and saved us. But as I flew back on the plane, I was forced to think to myself that there, there is no out. There's no around. There's no magic wand. That the only way out is through that we're going to do this, not only do you have to figure out how to solve this financial problem, we have to take on Blockbuster. And I got to say, there is nothing that focuses your mind like the realization you're going to have to take on a $6 billion category leader. Uh, if you had succeeded in convincing Blockbuster to buy you guys for $50 million, um, I imagine that today in 2020, uh, you might have been doing a little bit less surfing and a little bit more working a nine to five still. <laughs> uh, when you, and you'd, this, be, you'd be doing a little more blockbuster and chilling, which doesn't have quite the same <laughs> ring to it, you know? Not nearly, not, not nearly. Uh, when, when you, you know, now, now this gave you, and you talk a lot in the book about the decision you made to step away from Netflix and, and why you sold shares and, and things like that. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned there for the, the young and the ambitious Right now, it seems you spend a lot of time in sort of the giving back uh, world. I, I saw a blog post that you wrote uh, about, you know, coming to terms with the need to give back at some, uh, you know, as we've all been there, a Necker Island retreat with Richard Branson uh, and, and, and sort of deciding what it, what it means to give back and what you want your purpose to be after this whole thing. Uh, you are, among many things, uh, a entrepreneur in residence, I suppose, at High Point University uh, in North Carolina. You do a lot of speaking, a lot of coaching. If you were to be teaching, say, a and maybe you do teach a freshman seminar, for example, uh, on entrepreneurship, what do you think you'd, you'd spend your semester with a bunch of hungry 18-year-olds on? Uh, there's no question about what it is. There's a single thing. Listen, everybody has an idea. Everyone has a dream. Everyone gets told their high school graduation, follow your dreams. Um, but there's no follow your dreams 101 that uh, people get taught. And it's not like they don't have a shortage of dreams. Everyone has something they want to do. The problem is, is that every single person or almost every single person can come up with a dozen reasons why not now. Oh, I can't start my company because I need to finish school. I can't start. I need to be MBA. I need a computer science degree. I need a co-founder. I need money, uh, blah, 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 blah. And what I've learned from all these uh, people I've worked with, all the college students I've coached, all the companies I mentor, all the pitches I've heard is that um, anyone can do this stuff. You just have to figure out how to start. So what is my seminar about? It's absolutely showing people how to get started. That if you don't start, you don't get anywhere. And that usually all these barriers you think you have are false. That there are ways to start, to begin the learning, to take the, get the idea out of your head and collide it with the real world. Because once you do that, you realize that your idea wasn't perfect, but it begins informing the process. It begins helping you migrate your idea to something that is going to work. But that can't happen if it's all nicely, safely tucked in the warm, soft confines of your head. Um, and what I would teach people is how to take these ideas and start them. Oh, hey, on that note of inspiration, uh, Mark, I want to thank you so, so much for joining me today. This has been a, a real privilege and an absolute blast um, to do. So thank you. Where can people uh, read more about you, find you? Where, where would you direct people to learn more about uh, Mark Randolph? 
So probably the best place to start is my book, which is That Will Never Work, The Birth of Netflix and the Amazing Life of an Idea. But for kind of ongoing thoughts, ramblings, instructions, videos, et cetera, you can go to markrandolph.com, and that's R-A-N-D-O-L-P-H.com, and Mark with a C. Um, and of course, I'm on usual uh, social uh, stuff. Uh, at Twitter is MB Randolph, and Instagram is That Will Never Work. I love that. Mark Randolph. Thank you so, so much for both being on the podcast and starting Netflix. I don't know which one I'm more grateful for. <laughs> well, listen, both of them were fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. All right. That was awesome. Okay. That was good stuff. Thank you so much. That, that was uh, truly, I, I really appreciate it. And that was a real pleasure. I appreciate it too. And thanks. Good luck to you. Stay safe. And uh Thank you. If you have two minutes, I'd love to ask you two questions, uh, off, the, sure. off the record questions. Yeah. Um, the first one is, I mean, the way I met you was Gary was generous enough to introduce me. I would love to ask you the same. If there's any one or two people in your network who are just the best salespeople that you know, um, it would be a, a, real, a real privilege. And I'd be very grateful uh, if you could introduce well, <laughs> I'll think about that some. Uh, Gary, by far, is the best salesperson. I'll have I to know. do a round two with him then. <laughs> no, God, he's amazing. Uh, and I keep, I, I've learned a lot from just watching him. But I'll think about who else I could point you toward. That would be a, I'd be happy to do that. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Um, the second question I had uh, is actually more of just a super quick story. And that's that uh, your book was one of a few books that I read at a really uh, pivotal time. Your book, I think I read maybe two or three months ago. Um, and it's as I was, I, I found that a few companies, none really worked. Uh, now I've been leading sales for a self-driving car company. Um, this one right now, especially we were doing great. And then now, you know, self-driving cars are on nobody's mind. Um, and when I was reading your book, I was actually in the process of learning a lot about layoffs and interviewing lots of people. And you talked in that book about a massive layoff that you conduct at Netflix and that just, uh, all, all these you know, connect the stars, looking backwards, whatever came together. Uh, actually yesterday was a really big day because at around noon, um, I launched the company that is supposed to be the first step for people who have just been laid off. Um, and it's going to be sort of one single platform for people, companies, and governments to manage their layoffs that launched at noon. And at 1 PM, I got an email that I was laid off from my position as head of sales <laughs> at, at you know, so uh, that, that, that all came together. And I, I'm, I'm in a fantastic mood about it. I get to be my own first customer. I think the story is hilarious. And so uh, whatever. And so we launched this website. It's, it's riveterworks.com. Uh, my question for you is uh, if you do and under what context do you do any sort of angel investing? I'm speaking to Gary actually next week um, as well, but uh, wanted to ask you about that. Um, I'll give you the two second version. So yes, I do. Um, what I look for is evidence that your idea is a good one, Okay. <laughs> which means that I, I, I ask people to, to collect that evidence okay. and it does not listen to you. If you, it does not mean build out the website. It does not mean having scale. Mm -hmm. It means you think that this is a compelling proposition. Just imagine how crazy, it will, amazing it will be when all these people, all these companies, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. eh, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? What I'm looking for is the tests that you've done, the simple evidence you've gathered that proves that you're right. And that would, that would give you the confidence that it's worth investing the, the money into the next step of making that real. Okay. So otherwise, happy to chat with you, but that's what I would say. And listen, I, I, since you're mentioning that, I'm in the process of exploring doing a whole series of videos where I do uh, on real-time mentoring mm. with people. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you, you obviously are articulate enough, but it's an interesting enough and a timely enough subject that if you're willing to do it, quote unquote, uh, real-time, I'd be happy to hear your pitch and give you my feedback and my advice, if you would find it at all interesting. Oh, that would be, that would be such a blast. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, my, my dad made me do stand-up comedy at six years old, and it didn't go very well. Uh, but since then, I've kind of found a little bit of comfort doing some impromptu things. So I, I would love to do that. Yeah, it's just, it's just someone who's able to actually talk with the knowledge yeah. they're being recorded. It's not, as you yeah. know, it's not that big of a, uh, yeah. a barrier once you get over it. What are you, you, so what are you looking, what, what's the project you're working on? What are you looking to do? So, you know, um, 
for the last bunch of years, I've, I've been doing this. I've been doing two things, mentoring people and doing these keynote speeches. And they're diametrically opposed in terms of impact. Cause when I mentor a founding team, I spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours with them. And I move them a tremendous amount in their ability to convert their ideas into real businesses. But I can only do <laughs> very few people. So with the keynote speaking, I might get three or 4,000 people to spend an hour with me. So I can move a lot of people a little bit. Now the book was the next step in that because now I get, I can move, you know, a couple hundred thousand people, 16 hours worth, you know, and what I'm realizing is that I think this whole mission of mine, which is to really unlock people, um, hearing me do it one-on-one -on -one is not the same as having it done to you but it's, it's, it helps. And so I'm, tr I'm experimenting in my own, the model I use all the time, which is stop thinking, just do it, and you'll yeah. learn more from doing it. So I'm in the process of making a number of these recordings and then listening to them and saying, is this interesting? How can I be better? And if it turns out that they truly are interesting, then I'll probably try and begin in integrating them more into my social output as a way for people to learn some of these principles of how to unlock yourself. Very cool. So the context of it, two things come to mind, three things I suppose come to mind really quickly. One is Reed Hoffman and what he did with Masters of Scale. Do you know his podcast? Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yep. So he, he crushed it on that and that is and very highly produced and stuff, but it is awesome. Uh, the second one is, do you know Scott Galloway? I know the name. Yeah. So he, he's an NYU marketing professor. He founded um, a Red Envelope and a couple of big agencies, some big tech companies. Now he's a marketing professor and, and podcaster. And I actually just took his first ever online course. He founded a company called Section 4. Uh -huh. um, and I took an online course, paid $500, loved it. And now I think it looks like I'm going to be a TA for his next class in April. And he <laughs> cool. does an awesome, awesome job of like doing these digital videos and stuff like that. So um, if you, I'll send you their link, but if you're interested in, in just talking to somebody there. I know the CEO there um, was also a tech founder, Solte OL, like smart, smart guy, but like really awesome and super valuable educational tool for me. Uh, and the third is that was my advice. That was my, somebody gave me that advice when I launched this podcast. I just interviewed my best friend in my backyard, released it. And then five years later and hundreds of episodes later, uh, we got Mark Randolph on the show. So I totally agree with you. <laughs> you know, do, do it. Don't really care what it looks like. And then, and then it'll get better over time. So if you are interested, I, I, I'll send you an invite. We'll try, we'll try and find a time. And uh, again, don't, don't, don't do it as a favor for the podcast piece. But if you, if you want, want to pitch me your idea, I'd love to hear it as long as you're willing to let me. Uh, I'll jump you to the front of the queue as long as you're allowed to uh, that let is me such record a, it. That is such an easy trade for me. <laughs> no, no problem there. Uh, would you like to, uh, I could, I'll shoot you an email uh, sure. with a thank you. And then you could follow up with any time that works. I'm, now that I'm laid off and a founder, I got all the time in the world. So. <laughs> yeah, you'll find out now what it's like having it be a real day job. Really <laughs> like, and good luck. and. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm I, listen. I am in the best possible position. I got a lot of friends who are laid off into nothing. I was laid off into a company that's supposed to help people who are laid off. So my there you go. <laughs> my my job is is done for me. Uh, Great. So thank you very much. Awesome. Well, hey, I appreciate it. This, by the way, for context, will be out next Wednesday. Yeah. Um, so seven days from now, and I'll send you a link. Oh, God, I have all kinds of questions, but I'm I'm going to hold them until then. All right, whenever we'll whenever you. you want, man, I'm hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice talking to you. Thank Good you luck. so much. I really appreciate right, it. Ciao.